we've lost the grand narrative. We've lost what people believed before, which is that there's one story about reality and we're in the abyss, we're in chaos. And most people can't handle that. They're drowning in it and they're projecting false narratives. And you know, they're going back to these weird Cold War narratives and it, 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 it's all madness. But if you understand that it doesn't have to mean anything, you know, well, then you're, you take the, the magical view. It's like, you know, it's, it's a sea of chaos there for you to project pure will into. Welcome to the Cosmic Keys podcast. This is going to be your episode for December 9th to the 15th, 2019. And today we have an amazing interview with Jason Louv. He is a prolific author, and he's also the host of a podcast called Ultra Culture. So you're going to really enjoy that interview coming up. But before we get into it, we need to give you guys the forecast. And it's been a wild week. It was Thanksgiving. And we had the three of wands. So Dan, did you have a three of wands Thanksgiving? Wait, was it three of wands during Thanksgiving? No. Oh, shit. It was the three of wands <laughs> the weekend after, th- the week after Thanksgiving. Wait, so. We recorded, so listeners, we recorded this. Oh gosh, this, this is embarrassing. No, yeah. Well, we recorded this, um, a while, we recorded the, this previous week before Thanksgiving, then Scarlet went out of town. So we had the King of Wands for the week of Thanksgiving, and then we had the Three of Wands for the week after Thanksgiving. So to answer your question, you you want the truth? Yeah, I want the truth. Okay, this is kind of personal, and I just really wanted to talk about this on the show. So we've been getting really good cards over this these past few weeks. And the astrology has also been pretty good, too. But to be 100% frank, I had some, like, confrontations with um, problems in my life. I had, like, sort of flares of little short-term depressive episodes. And it was really, and I'm just being honest, you know... I wanted to take this opportunity to be like, there's a point where astrology and tarot actually doesn't. It serve. fails. It yeah. fails because, yeah. you know, for as good as the week it could have been on a big scale or whatever, you know, when you're really uh, having a hard time and your mental health is actually like at a low low, that's where the that's the point at which astrology and tarot like can't help you and you need to use other resources and i remember and this was you know nothing to worry about it it for me when i go th- when i hit those moments where it's it's actually very sort of cathartic and um it's kind of like your check engine light goes on you're like i got to make a change in my life you know but it, it it these past few weeks that we've been getting these good cards and that the astrology's been good has been when I'm like quote sort of doubting it all t- in a way. And and now that I'm past all of that, it's not that I doubt astrology. I just wanted to bring this point home that for those of you out there that actually have, you know, that are dealing with something, you need to talk to somebody about it and you need to um really sort it out and not just be like waiting for the king of wands or <laughs> Jupiter conjunct Venus or Jupiter and Sagittarius or whatever like good stuff that that's not going to save you when real issues are at hand and I'm totally like in a great mood this week and actually have had a great 3 of wands week but back la- last week when we when it was the holiday and we had the king of wands I just remember in that moment I was like I have to talk about this on the podcast because it would be disingenuous of me to not be honest and be like, there's a certain point where you should not use tarot and astrology for serious issues, you know? So that's my little rant. This week, the Three of Wands did come through, partially because I'm sort of getting things in motion post, you know, rock bottom. (laughs) But yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, you're right. I think tarot and astrology is meant to be a tool in your toolbox. Exactly. And it's just one of the ways that we like deal with the world. And sometimes it's useful and sometimes it can be really meaningful. And sometimes it's not the tool we need at that particular moment. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason we do this show is to learn how to use these tools. But, you know, it's important to, to know when it is the right choice and the wrong choice to use those tools. And last week when I was waiting for the King of Wands, like cocky energy to come through, I was like, you know, very depressed and just like not King of Wands. So I just wanted to like slip that in and just bring this woo woo stuff, a little reality check. Um, But to answer the question of this previous card of the week, weirdly the three of i am feeling very three of wands this week so yeah i mean it's it comes in cycles i think especially with not just tarot but spirituality in general like sometimes i feel like i'm on the current and i'm just like vibing with everything and like it's all really resonating and really meaningful and helping me and then other times i kind of just fall out of it for like a week or two and then i come back eventually but it's kind of the cycles of life well and 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 i mean the, the tarot cards and the astrology and the planets have nothing to do with like seasonal s- s- lack of sunlight and literally like seasonal depression, which is very real in Chicago. So right. it's the darkest time of the year right now, right yeah. before the solstice. And, and, you know, in my in my process of figuring out like what was going on, I was reading old journals and usually the week of Thanksgiving is when like the lack of vitamin D and like the mental health stuff it basically three years in a row it comes out of nowhere like i remember two years ago i sat in bed like a depressed person and just binged twin peaks oh i love twin so i watched the old (laughs) twin peaks start to finish like thanksgiving like 2017 maybe or 2016 but anyways guys um I just wanted to be real and honest with you because if I was like, oh, yeah, just, you know, wait for Jupiter conjunct Venus to save the day, that would be harmful. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Jupiter is not always going to come and save the day. No, definitely not. (laughs) Well, we have... So anyways, we got that out of the way. (laughs) We we got it off our chest. I mean, I had a pretty decent week relatively. Like, it was a big pain trying to come back to Chicago with the weather. I was stuck in the airport forever. But and and just in general, the holidays bring this stuff up. Oh, it does. For me, it's it's like Christmas when I feel like more depressed. Really? And and even though like I'm a pagan, so I do my own personal Yule thing, but I still have like family, you know, so I I do the Christmas thing for them on the 25th, too. And that's always kind of depressing for me just because, you know, family situations and um yeah so i feel that way more on christmas than i do for thanksgiving yeah i i was like very i was thinking i was just anti-holidays during thanksgiving week but then i like talked to some people and got a lot sort of figured out and now i'm actually like very merry (laughs) which is really weird but Maybe you're just bipolar. <laughs> that could be true also. Well, no, it's, it's... No, you're not. And even if I was, you know, things... That's how mental health works with some people. Right. It comes in waves. And a lot of the times it does align with these things like tarot and astrology. And then other times you have to be like, no, it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. Well, that was some deep, deep talk. But I feel I like it's good to talk about mental health. I mean, yeah, it's important. Yeah, because, I mean... This is this is the holidays. This is it's getting dark at 4 p.m. It's the time when things get really stressful for yeah. me. And I think for many like people out there. Although, you know, when you sort of reflect on the it getting dark during this time of year during Sagittarius season, weirdly like in November Scorpio season, it's just dark and gloomy, but now it's like really dark and you're like what the fuck but then the the christmas lights come on and you're like oh so maybe like christmas lights are just a way of coping with that and that's why we have them but anyways can you imagine back in the day how dark and miserable it'd be though oh well that's why we have this holiday 
Liter- yeah. It's literally a coping me- mechanism. <laughs> I think you're right to some degree for sure. Especially in Chicago. Yeah. Well, are we ready to see the card of the week? Yeah, 10 minutes in, we are. Okay. We love fortune. Ooh, speaking of Jupiter. <laughs> exactly, yes. Um, so this is a fun card. Have we had the Wheel of Fortune before? I think we have. We did, yeah. And you know what song kept playing on the radio that week? What? It's like, you spin me right <laughs> round, baby, right round right. like a record, baby. I remember that from like the school dances. Back in like high school, middle school, was that? No, that was from like before you were born, like oh, the eighties. It must have been like middle school dances. It's like they a were cocaine eighties song. But <laughs> anyways, so our wheel of fortune. This is this is a fun card. So it's a major. So it's a big deal. And um, here we are talking about something a bit cryptic. It's a bit mysterious. The wheel of fortune has all these like fun symbols on it, and. It means that the universe is going to throw something at you. The wheels of karma are shifting and turning. Now, this could be a good thing if you're in a bit of a depressive rut. Um, The Wheel of Fortune can be fun. It might throw some synchronicities at you, get you more, um, feel connected to the universe. The Wheel of Fortune card, too, it's not even like on Earth. It's like in the sky, in the clouds. It's very spiritual and universal in that way. And it's saying that, you know, the universe is going to kind of shift things around to put you on a particular path this week. So there's a sense of kind of needing to just surrender to it for the moment and see where things take you. It can be good. I mean, of course, when you say the Wheel of Fortune, I always think of like the game show, right? Like the Wheel of Fortune, you know? So, I mean, it can be a good surprise from the universe. Maybe you get like uh, some... You find a $50 bill on the ground. Who knows what could happen? It could be crazy. Um, Or it could be a bit darker. But the point is, this is a time to just let the universe do its thing. Pay attention to some fun synchronicities that are probably going to show up this week. And ride it out and enjoy this shift um, in the wheel that is occurring. So it's a bit of an unknown and it's meant to be unknown. I always think of this card, it's like a meta joke, you know, like it's a joke to tarot readers because it's saying, oh, you think you know what the universe is going to do? Oh, let me throw a curveball at you. You can't predict this. Yeah. Um. So, so yeah, I mean, get ready for it. <clears throat> uh, hopefully you'll enjoy it when it comes and you just kind of got to ride it out. Well, now that there's a little more context, like I remember the last week we got this and I remember in the beginning of the week, I was like, bad fortune like bad luck in the beginning but then by the end of the week more random good luck stuff had happened and it was like a net gain of good but um if there's any repeat of the last time we got this card um it was kind of like when you think your luck is gone it sort of comes back bigger than than the bad luck came through with but um in terms of the astrology, I already know exactly what aspect <laughs> this is related to, and that comes at the end of the week. So before we get to the end of the week, which I think is a good example of the Wheel of Fortune, we start the week off with Mercury, planet of communication, leaving Scorpio and entering Sagittarius, and that's happening early on Monday morning. So December 7th, uh, this previous Saturday... Marked the end of the Mercury retrograde through Scorpio shadow. So like, and I'm a Scorpio rising. So this Mercury retrograde is kind of, I think, kind of related to my fluctuations in like mood and stuff. Um, But honestly, you know, even though I was just, you know, being emo and talking about depression and stuff today, like. Like I said, the the depression was sort of like a check engine light and I sorted things out and sort of addressed it and now I feel much better. So if you dealt with any kind of disruption or, you know, confusion during the shadow period, I noticed the shadow was a little bit harsher than the actual retrograde for me on a personal level. This previous Saturday was the end of it. And now Mercury is in a whole new sign 
in Sagittarius during Sagittarius season. So when Mercury's in Sagittarius, you know, you think about the symbolism of Sag. It's boisterous, loud, bold, doesn't really care what other people think, um, and just says what's on their mind and is big about it, big and bold. So, you know, Mercury is technically um, in their, what is it, in their fall. No, they're in their detriment in Sagittarius because Mercury rules Gemini, which is opposite of Sagittarius. So it's not like optimal (laughs) Mercury placement. However, it's not terrible. Like, just be aware that you and those around you may have the tendency to sort of like um, have no filter in the way mm-hmm. you communicate. I feel like I'm feeling that already, it's oversharing on this episode. But um, there can be some like foot and mouth disease with Mercury and Sagittarius. But overall, the, the retrograde shadow is behind us. You're going to have a fiery, spicy Mercury life starting on Monday. You know, it reminds me of like the Knight of Swords, just like jumping in to things, rushing in. Yeah. Thinks he's the best, thinks he knows everything. Right. <laughs> and then in reality, is kind of naive about the whole situation. Yeah. So you you could see maybe a tendency of saying things that you later regret or being on your soapbox because Sagittarius is ruled by Jupiter and um, it's kind of like moral moral judgments when because jupiter and sag are related to like morality religion philosophy so it could be like oh well you're wrong and you're also a bad person it's like debate time (laughs) yes so it can be cool but also just be aware and if you feel the urge to just spit something out that's inflammatory maybe take a step back and (laughs) Give yourself a minute to let it cool and ask yourself, do I still want to say that? Chances are you won't. Um, So, yeah, just pay attention to that for the next two or three weeks as Mercury is now in Sagittarius. So Monday also the the moon is going to be in Taurus, which is a nice placement. Um, Tuesday the moon enters Gemini. So Gemini is the sign that the full moon is going to take place in. And... Let's see. Before we get to the actual full moon that happens late Wednesday night, early Thursday morning, we have this aspect on Wednesday with love planet Venus going conjunct with Saturn. So both Venus and Saturn are in earthy Capricorn this week. And when they come together, they kind of blend their energies. So um, with Venus being your relationships, your aesthetics, finances, um, beauty, and Saturn being the restrictive father time figure, it, it, it can be kind of reality check time with your relationships. So, Ouch. <laughs> it's, it, it's ouch, but it's also, it's, it, can, it can be helpful too. It can be like... Um, going to the the marriage counselor or the couples counselor and having them be like reality check like time to get real. So, you know, this could be useful for people who like need to do like Christmas shopping because yeah. if Venus is also finances and Saturn's like restricting, we all need a bit of restricting when it comes to spending this time of year a little bit. I know I tend to go a bit overboard. So, it could be a good thing when you re- Think about it in that way. Yeah, this season... Well, I heard other astrologers. I forget where I heard this, but they were referring to 2019 Christmas season causing people to be a little bit more frugal um, and a little bit less overabundant with their spending, even by the fact that Black Friday happened like the very last... There's like a week less of the shopping season if you start the shopping season on Black Friday because of the the way that Thanksgiving fell this year. Um, it's a shorter shopping season, which is a good thing. But yeah, there might be like in general a tendency to spend less, which is good and save and be more practical. You know, Jupiter is in Capricorn now. That's a big shift. Jupiter was in its home sign of Sag. And then last week it shifted into Capricorn. 
I'm already feeling that heavy Capricorn energy. And even though Jupiter is supposed to be in its fall in Capricorn and and it rules Sagittarius, it's in its domicile in Sagittarius. You know, I'm, from what I've observed, I kind of like the Capricorn, like, um, practical energy that we're sort of feeling now with these with these alignments happening. Yeah, I've been feeling a bit more productive lately. Yeah. So I could be a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, because Jupiter and Sag is like, everything is great and it will just come to me. Perfect. I don't have to think about it. I just am lucky. And now Jupiter and Capricorn is like, do the damn work. <laughs> you do the damn work budget. And it's funny, we kind of talk about this with Jason in our interview today, too. So, yeah, enjoy the frugal energy of Venus conjunct Saturn on Wednesday. And then, so at 12.12 12 a.m. Eastern Time, Thursday morning, Wednesday night, we have the full moon in Gemini. So, Gemini is a chatty, social, fun air sign ruled by Mercury. And when the sun is in Sag and the moon is in Gemini, the sun and the moon oppose each other. And then we get our full moon in Gemini. So I feel like if you haven't scheduled some kind of holiday get together, Wednesday night would be a good night to schedule it because it's, it's a good full moon for social things. Um, I want to do like a cookie exchange party. Have you ever heard of that? I've heard. Yeah, I've heard. I've never it's like done it. But. Super lame. It's like everyone bakes a dozen cookies and then you all like swap the cookies around. So you come out of the party with like a box of all these different types of Christmas cookies. Yeah, it sounds very Gemini. I, I like that. <laughs> um, and the fact that we got the Wheel of Fortune card, I, I, I still think of the Wheel of Fortune as an overall good card. And this yeah. Gemini moon happening on uh, Wednesday night, I think it's going to be a good moon, too. So enjoy that. So Friday the 13th. Dun, dun, dun. Um, by then, the moon will be in Cancer. So a Cancer moon, the moon rules Cancer. Um, and Cancer moon makes you want to get cozy, comfy, safe, secure, and emotional and empathetic with your loved ones, with yourself. It's all about self-care starting on friday oh that's a good day to watch like a cozy holiday movie totally yeah and so there's some other interesting aspects happening as that happens so mars which is in scorpio right now it's going to try neptune so as we have the watery cancer moon you know mars the action warrior planet with neptune the outer planet of like psychic visions they're trining and flowing together So you can do something actively creative and spiritual on Friday. So it's a good, I think it's a good placement. Mars trying Neptune. Um, Just think about how you can put, how you can be active in something that, that is related to creativity, visions, dreams, poetry, you know, that other world stuff. So that's happening on Friday the 13th. We also have Venus who conjuncted Saturn on Wednesday because Saturn and Pluto are about to go conjunct in Capricorn, which is this like big deal in astrology. It's happening in January, but because they move so slow, they're basically a couple degrees away from each other right now. So we are already feeling it. And these are things that the Saturn-Pluto conjunction happening in January next month is sort of the big deal that everyone's making about 2020. It's making us think about these global things happening in the world related to politics, related to structure, and um, Pluto being the destructive breakdown, raw rawness, and Saturn being structure we're already feeling that start to build and it will officially happen in January. But this week, Venus is coming up from behind. It's going to totally conjunct Saturn on Wednesday and totally conjunct Pluto on Friday. But for all intents and purposes, Venus is going to be feeling it from like for basically like to like the whole week. <laughs> from like, oh, no, I don't think she's going to like that. 
Well, she probably won't, but there are lessons to be learned. You know, pay attention to, you know, with Pluto being this outer planet in Capricorn, Venus being relationships, money, love, beauty, you know, take notes. You know, it's going to be an intense, it's going to be intense Wednesday, Thursday, Friday with a lot of good and some maybe tricky stuff, which (laughs) when I think of the card. It's kind yeah. of appropriate for the car. It's like I'm going to get some new wrinkles on my face with <laughs> Venus next to Saturn. But you might you might be like sh- delightfully surprised or just Pluto is a very raw planet. So Pluto is going to be like yo, this is this here's reality and you don't have a choice. The reality is going to hit you and you can't be in denial under Pluto. So your relationship um <sighs> Whatever, if you're in a relationship, that whatever happens in your relationship this week could be a sign of what's happening on a bigger scale in the entire world. So, and it could be any type of relationship, by the way, not just your significant others. It, It could be like, hey, this week I had a really rocky but insightful or, you know, difficult but empowering feeling. That's happening on a big scale to the entire world. So that's kind of abstract to talk about, but that's what the astrology says. Random question on the Pluto-Saturn coming together. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of funny just because I've been like reading the news and all those like, okay, boomer memes. Yeah. I kind of feel like millennials were like Pluto, right? And the Mm -hmm. boomers are Saturn. That's very, (laughs) and we're like clashing together right now. Yeah. Because Saturn is like old structures and Pluto is raw realness. The millennials were born with Pluto and Scorpio and Scorpio is Pluto's favorite, one of his favorite signs. And the, the rawness of the old, like the rawness and the realness and the destructiveness and the power of Pluto is going to break Saturn structure so that's what astrologers are worried about they're like there's going to be these like clashes with old structures so as we see in the world that there are protests there are crazy freaking like abuses of collecting our data and privacy and like there's all this like sort of Saturnian um, control Right. That's confronting 1984 stuff. Yeah. But it's being confronted with the more powerful will of the Pluto energy, which will destroy it. So right now we're, st- so we're like starting to feel it because they're only a couple <laughs> degrees apart. But then in January, it's going to like really come to head. Yes. And throughout. So it's going to go come ahead in January for the first time. But then both planets are going to go retrograde throughout 2020. So there will be other direct hits later in the year. And then Jupiter is going to come up from behind later in the year and expand it all. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) Well, this also, again, ties in with our conversation with Jason, where we talk about kind of the upcoming decade and and where society is heading. So why does that always happen? Whenever we talk to somebody about some subject... Like the conversation reflects what's going on in the stars. Because that is a very Plutonic conversation that we had with Jason. <laughs> Jason <was laughs> You're going like, to enjoy it. <laughs> it was, he was like, I hope it wasn't too ranty and dark. I'm like, that's what we like. <laughs> we, we are Pluto and Scorpio. Like we live for that stuff. Yes. Bring us, bring it, bring it on, bring it on. But okay. And it's happening on Friday the 13th. Too. Oh, wonderful. So, yeah, um, that's happening. Um, Moon. So moving on to Saturday. We're not done yet, folks. This is actually a gnarly, gnarly week. I didn't even look beforehand. So Saturday, Moon enters Leo at 10.56 p.m. late at night. Um, And then Sunday is the final thing, which I mentioned earlier, reminds me of the Wheel of Fortune card. So Sunday... There goes, sorry for my loud beer clink. Sunday. This is sort of like a very like once in a lifetime alignment, actually. Oh, I'm excited. So Jupiter, freshly in the sign of Capricorn, is going to trine Uranus 
freshly, not so freshly, but early in the sign of Taurus. So Jupiter, planet of expansion and growth, is in Capricorn, early Capricorn, because it just entered Capricorn last week. Uranus has been hanging out in early Taurus. And if Jupiter is expansion, Uranus is explosions and radical change and surprises and revolutions and disruptions. So these two are in Earth signs, Jupiter in the Earth sign of Capricorn, Uranus in the Earth sign of Taurus. They're flowing together. So Jupiter is going to be like, expand radical craziness in Taurus. And it's going to be a nice flow, though. So when I think about our card of the week, the Wheel of Fortune, it's like, shocking you, the wheel is spinning luck is like holy shit what is going on you don't know what's happening and then this uranian jupiterian trine you know there's only going to be one trine between jupiter and uranus i believe in the entire 7 year period that uranus is in taurus so this is another big picture thing as we get closer to the Saturn-Pluto conjunction in Capricorn on Sunday at 8.34, or no, what time? Uh, at 2.01 p.m. Eastern, Jupiter will try on Uranus. And we'll be feeling that the entire weekend, too, because Jupiter's slow moving. So I think expect the unexpected this week. Um, it's going to be a lot of intense and powerful stuff happening. But given that we have the Wheel of Fortune card, I'm hopeful that, um, you know, with this, with all these things happening, that it might, it might throw us all off for a little bit. But like before, I think the net gain will hopefully be positive. And we'll be feeling that Jupiter your honest thing into next week as well. So pay attention to the news and like what type of earth based, maybe environment, environmental related. I hope it's not some kind of natural disaster, but think about how the earth could be shaken up and disrupted or dismantled for a moment. But since it's a trine and Jupiter is a good planet, benefic planet, it might be, um, for our benefit, hence the Wheel of Fortune. Well, it's going to be a wild ride. I'm excited to see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> so we're at 32 minutes. Oh, my gosh. Partially because I just did on-air therapy in the beginning of the episode. No, it's, but it's good. I mean, last week we're it keeping was, it real. We keep it real with our listeners. Yeah, I don't want to be selling no new age snake oil to our audience. <laughs> I want to say, hey, if you're depressed... Talk to somebody, do something about it. Don't look at your birth chart. I mean, maybe look at your birth chart, but don't rely don't on Don't only it. look at your birth no. chart. And I had to get that out and share it. But now that we've got this like intense forecast out of the way, get ready for another intense conversation with an intense, magical occultist and teacher and podcaster and author, Jason Louv, coming up next. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> John D. and the Empire of Angels. That's just one of his many books. And he is the host of the podcast Ultra Culture. 
And we are really excited to speak with you today. I know we've um, read some of your books. We've listened to your podcast. So this is really exciting having you on. So how are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for having me on. I mean, it's you know, it's it's a pretty it's a pretty quiet Thursday afternoon here. So happy to hang out. Yeah, I'm all thrown off. I forgot it was Thursday today. <laughs> <laughs> so Jason, thanks for being on the show. Um, I told you before we started recording that um, I read John D. and the Empire of Angels back when it came out in 2018, and that really changed my sort of view of of history i would say and and reality in a lot of ways so um for anyone that is interested in john d and like the elizabeth elizabethan era of england check that book out but we usually like to start our podcast um at the beginning so tell us a little bit like about your early life jason um were you raised with any particular religion and when did spirituality and occultism start to to enter your life? I was actually not not raised in any particular any particular religion outside of kind of the nominal non denominational Christianity. That's just kind of was at least at that time the default setting in the U.S. Uh, but you know certainly not you know any type of real organized religion. So I did this all to myself, um, but. Yeah, I, you know, my, my early upbringing, not particularly remarkable. Uh, I grew up kind of in the suburbs, reading and consuming the same stuff as everybody else in the 80s and 90s. But I, I don't know, I, it's, hard, it's hard for me to pinpoint why I became interested in this stuff other than um, I was in the void, I think, in, in the sense that, you know, the suburbs are extremely... Uh, 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 empty of, of a whole lot going on. Um, I was sick a lot as a kid, so I was taken out of school quite quite a bit. And as a young, very young, in third grade or so, uh, there was I had mono for an extended period of time and had to lay in the dark without moving for I think close to three months um, to prevent my spleen from rupturing. And I think that I can probably pinpoint as you know, the initi- initiatory moment because, you know, not only I was basically hallucinating in another world for three months and then wasn't quite on the same page as everyone when they put me back in school. And that continued all the way through the rest of my school and even into college where I was just at an angle from everyone else because I'd been, had this brief moment where I'd been taken out of the, you know, the, the trance induction of modern education. Uh, you know, it's a great blessing. And, uh, but I became interested in, what you might call the more formal occult when I was 16, 15, 16, because I just, nothing, you know, nothing that I was learning, you know, had any type of explanatory power for me for what I was seeing. You know, certainly I was learning psychology, none of, you know, none of this stuff um, fully was able to explain not just reality to me, but uh, what, what a, what a path forward for a human being could be like. And I became fascinated with the, the idea, well, if psychology tells us basically what is a suboptimal human being, is there a way to become more than human? Is there a way to not even become more than human, but fully optimize one's own psychology? Original idea, it's actually the idea that drove the human potential movement in the, in the 70s in California, which is where I'm from, but uh, it struck me as a, an original idea at the time. Um, I was very influenced by a writer named Colin Wilson, uh, an English existentialist author who wrote, wrote quite a bit about this in the 60s and 70s um, and was unfortunately blackballed from the British liter- literary establishment and not particularly taken um, And I became fascinated with individuals like Crowley and Gurdjieff and Blavatsky. And, and then at that time, chaos magic was all the rage. Uh, and I say all the rage, meaning this stuff was extremely hard to find information about, even in the late 90s. Um, and, and so to find something like the culture, you really had to not only dig, you know, beyond what was available, uh, you know, just the internet was happening. So there was a little bit of a, a tiny, tiny window where there were a few web pages where you could find things. Um, but you really had to dig into like the deepest, darkest corners of our culture to find it. And then to meet other people who were 
involved in that. That was a real um, initiatory task. I mean, you really had to go to the wrong side of the tracks, you know, to dangerous parts of our society to find that stuff. And, and, and that's what I did. I mean, I spent, um, you know, I spent probably my entire early 20s doing that and traveling all over the world and joining every single initiatory order I could find from chaos magic groups to hermetic groups to Sufism to masonry to uh, all, all kinds of other stuff that I'm probably forgetting. Um, it was very much like the opening of Batman Begins <laughs> or Doctor Strange, you know, because I spent a lot of time in, in, in the Himalayas actually uh, uh, learning prior before that movie came out. I was watching that movie in the theater. I was like, this movie was like made about me. It's the same about Doctor Strange. I spent a lot of time in, Him in the Himalayas training as a shaman in Nepal and also learning, um, you know, many of the occult, occult systems there like Tantra. Um, and, and, th and that continued all the way through my, you know, r really up until my mid to late twenties when I reached a point where I'd already had a couple books out, but I reached a point, it was kind of a critical mass point where it just became clear that uh, the way forward was trying to pass this stuff on it and teach, teach other people this material. Um, I think this happens for some people. So uh, that's kind of my story. It's a really weird, it's a, it's, I, I don't have a, you know, it's, it's hard for me to piece it together. Although I guess it makes it piece it all together. Although I guess it makes sense in retrospect, but um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I love how you were so interested in these initiatory practices and like chasing after them and across the world. Because nowadays, it's such a different experience because we have a glut of information available to us online that it's kind of like weeding through and trying to find the gems. Um, and that was definitely kind of a little bit my experience where I was like just looking at all these different websites and trying to figure out what was real, what was not. Um, but I love that you kind of, you like, you walk the walk, like you went to around the world and found some shamans and learn from these masters and I find that really inspiring and really gutsy to kind of you know believe in yourself so much that you're like I'm gonna go out there and seek these answers and yeah I was totally thinking about Doctor Strange that movie too it's my favorite Marvel movie <laughs> so yeah that's yeah, such a wonderful that. story and a wonderful kind of introduction for you into this world of the occult i find it so fascinating well i think you have to I, I mean you say believe in myself it's like well i'd like to say that but i think it was more believing that the answers were out there because you know i i wanted this wasn't just for fun you know it's like i felt a deep need to um, heal myself and fix myself and and that's what really inspired a lot of the seeking and um i think that um but you know we're, we're all and we all need that as human beings. Human beings are basically, uh, and I, I think that we need, we need that initiatory experience, which unfortunately our culture doesn't provide us with. I would also say that, um, you know, things definitely have changed. I mean, even in, I said in my first book, you know, that the, the millennials were going to be an occult generation and it had happened, you know, it was, it was like, I knew like five people who were interested in magic at the time, but it definitely, now it's happened, it, you know, the prediction or the enchantment came true, but the, I would say there's not necessarily a glut of information. There's a glut of um, data. Uh, there's a glut of um, opinion. On, I don't think that I'm, I, I actually count myself lucky that I underwent all this at the time because I had to go seek it out. Now there's so much um, bad information. No, they're not necessarily bad, but uninitiated, you know, in a sense that it's being, it's being put out there by people who are putting out their best guess, who in many cases don't have a grounding, even don't even have a grounding in the classics of, for instance, the Golden Dawn um, uh, or whatever other tradition they're, they're talking about. And so unfortunately, as a result, it's become more of an exercise in identity and identification with the outsider, which is what it always was. But these are, these are, you know, it's, it's called the occult for a reason, meaning it's hidden. And I don't necessarily think it's any less hidden than it was before. It's just that there are a lot more signposts pointing to it. I think a good movie, which I'm sure you've seen and a lot of your listeners have seen, is The Holy Mountain makes that point 
early where they're, I don't know if, if you have seen that, but they're, they're hiking up the mountain seeking initiation. And they stop at this place called the Pantheon Bar, which is full of, you know, all the people uh, kind of um, pitching or selling halfway solutions. And it's making a circus of new age spirituality. And most people get stuck there. And then the heroes continue to hike upwards to the top of the mountain where they must undertake the very unromantic and, and, uh, and, and harrowing experience of confronting themselves which is where the real stuff actually happens. So, um, sorry, that's a bit of a tangent, but no, that, well, that definitely resonates with me. And I'm wondering when you're in this phase, um, I, I, I guess the question I'm, I'm thinking of is like, what was motivating you was, were you, do you think you were motivated by any kind of like trauma or, um, cause when I think about my own journey, like, I don't, I think this path into these subjects sort of chose me and I don't think anybody that's serious about it, like willingly enters it, but it, there's some other reason. And I'm wondering, um, like what was driving you and did you have any like companions along the way or mentors along oh, the way? Yeah, tons, 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 tons. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you meet, you meet some of the best and some of the worst people in the occult world, you know, truly it's the best and the worst of humanity. Um, I think that, yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, the, the need to understand and overcome traumas, you know, absolutely. But that, that kind of reduces it, I think, to, you know, some type of, you know, uh, I don't know. It, it makes it, that oprah it way too much. I absolutely chose this. I mean, don't make a mistake. I mean, this, I, I, I willfully um, went into this for, for years and still am, you know, like years and years and years. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a passion for me. So it's not like, um, but there's certainly an aspect of it where, I, well, let me put it this way. The path of initiation, people have all these ideas about it, like, oh, you're going to get magical powers and all of this stuff, or it's so colorful. And yes, it can be quite colorful. But, you know, ultimately, the path of initiation is the path of maturation. It's the path of becoming a human being. And that path is mirrored um, throughout all levels of our society. It's in our, it's in our art, you know, it's in, our, it's in our fiction. That's why people love movies like star wars so much it's not the special it's not the special effects you know it's because in the original star wars it's because of the initiatory uh, um, journey that is depicted in it same with the christopher nolan batman movies which i love which are like the, the left hand path version of star wars um you know i think people need that they they need they need that feeling of initiation of becoming a full adult that's critical for all societies all societies need that, uh, and, and our society has disregarded it. But also, people feel powerless now, despite the fact that the, you know electronic media has made them more powerful than any people in any other time in history. Paradoxically, people feel very powerless, and so it's not a mistake that people are much more interested in these things. Um, I think that when the, Soviet, when the Berlin Wall fell, when the Soviet Union fell, one of the first things that happened was that all of the young people became fascinated with the occult in a much more um, studious and serious way than most Americans. And I think that that's probably a process that's happening in the U.S. and the West generally right now, which is we're, we're living through the fall of the, of the empire. And so and nothing is a given, nothing is secure, everything feels quite anxiety-inducing. Nobody seems to have it figured out. There don't seem to be any adults. So it makes perfect sense to me that people would be seeking stability in, I guess, in a, in a deeper sense or a higher reality, whatever you want to, whatever you want to put it. But th this is just, you know, it's nothing new. It's, it's, this is, if you go back to Plato, if you go back to the original foundational uh, writers of, you know, the Greek Ellicinian mysteries and, and of our culture, this is just, and, and not just our culture, but any culture, you look at uh, Indian culture or a Chinese culture, any, any culture around the world, they all have, their initiatory component. And so for me, the, the shocking thing is not that suddenly it is so fascinating to people. The shocking thing is that it was missing for so long. It's kind of like, I, I think that people without that in their culture are like a little bit like cats with their whiskers cut off without, and, and 
by initiation, I mean a method to become fully human, to become fully adult, and to attain self-knowledge before one undertakes the serious tasks of adult life. And um, I think the rest of the world sees us like that. Unfortunately, that's certainly been my experience. Yeah, I'm definitely with you on the importance of initiation. And it's fascinating, too, because when I first got into this kind of stuff, I was 16 and and learning about Wicca. So I did like a little self-initiation with like three of my friends and, and found that immensely meaningful. But that was just like, you know, not even close to a proper initiatory practice. And I think you're right that it has been missing from our lives for so long and it is so greatly important. Not too long ago, I was at a bar mitzvah of like an extended family member. And I'm like, wow, this is like actually really meaningful and amazing. And it was the only bar mitzvah I've ever been to. And it made me wish um, as I'm a pagan. So as a pagan, I'm like, well, what would a pagan (laughs) initiation into adulthood look like in a modern context? So this is something I've been thinking about a lot. And I, I think you're right that there is this deep need for meaning, um, especially among millennials right now and, and even Gen Z, where we're searching for some type of initiatory system or practice. Um, but it seems like it's hard to find, or maybe it's becoming harder to find, or maybe we're just not brave enough to seek it out. Because I talk to pagans and you know witches all the time and they're all solitary I don't know one person who's like a gardenarian or um, anyone who's been in a serious initiatory system so but I think the need is there I think the want is there it's just kind of how do we fit that into our modern life yeah yeah. I totally agree and I mean this is why I do what I do I mean this is why I do my magic classes at magic.me but I think that um, yeah, everyone, everyone needs to basically be told how to be an adult and not just how to be an adult, but the great thing about esoteric spirituality is you get handed the real core, um, secrets of be- what, of life, you know, the core wisdom that's been passed down from thousands of years. That's what these things are, are you know, whether it's the I Ching or the tarot or, or, or any Kabbalah, any of these things, it's, it's kind of uh, symbolic arcs to pass down wisdom intergenerationally over thousands of years. Uh, and, and because they're codified into symbols, it makes it much more the translation much easier. But I think that, I mean, you talk about solitary initiation. I mean, that's how I started. I've always been, you know, I, even though I've been in many, many, many orders, everyone's a solitary practitioner at the end of the day. Uh, and and so self-initiation is initiation. If you do it sincerely, if you get the universe to talk back, that's initiation. I mean, all that a quote unquote real initiation, like a temple initiation can do is hope to um, catalyze that experience in somebody. In some ways they're less effective because people kind of can sleepwalk through them, unfortunately, which is uh, not, not so much the case when they self initiate. Um, But you know, there's, there's benefits, there's pros and cons to both. And they're both kind of different things in a sense. But the whole point of initiation is you, you make a statement to the universe and you get the universe to talk back. Then the universe begins initiating you. You know, then you can't escape. <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, I'm sure, you, I'm sure everyone knows what I'm talking about, you know. So um, I think that, yeah, and, 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 and so organized practice has a lot of cons too. And, and I think that it's more important to bring one's individual sincerity to the practice and you know because otherwise it just becomes religion then you're just meeting up with people to decide you all believe the same thing and there's there's really not a whole lot of use in that and i don't think that people are very interested in that in in the modern world although it can certainly be um you know any 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 way to build positive community is much lacking and much needed you know so yeah, I definitely agree with that too. Um, so Scarlett and I both listened to a recent episode on your podcast, Ultra Culture, and it was called Void of Course. And it was kind of like an hour of you um, sharing a lot of different ideas about sort of the state of modernity right now and how fragmented our culture is. Um, 
And we kind of wanted to explore some of those themes too, because we are about to enter the new decade and there's a lot of discussions happening on podcasts about the future. And there's a lot, I'm just hearing futurists talk a lot right now. Um, But what do you, uh, I'm trying to just think of how to frame this. Like, so in that episode, you you kind of referred to a little bit of like post-structuralism and how when we go to university, we're basically taught that um, everything is like a construct and nothing is real. The universe is just void of meaning. And um, I'm wondering how you think that's affecting us right now. And also, how is that helping or harming the occult right now because when I think of post-structuralism I can't help but think of chaos magic so where do you like where are we right now and where should we be heading well yeah I mean it's it's a big question but actually there's a simple answer which is it's all doth right if you know Kabbalah so uh, we you know we entered we we were in a cultural doth period and have been for a couple several decades now and Doth in the Kabbalah is the, the non-existent sphere that is concerned with a breakdown of the mind and the demonstration that there, you know, that basically the mind is purely a construct and that all knowledge is a construct and that all knowledge is self, you know, any, any statement you can make about reality contains it will automatically contain its own self-defeating opposite. And, but this is a, this is a period you have to remember that at least in somebody's initiatory career comes after multiple decades of self-integration along the earlier spheres, you know? And so our culture is caught in the abyss in, in Doth. And so in, so in the Kabbalah, the way to transcend Doth is silence. It's to completely, and one transcends basically out of the chaos of the mind into Bina, which is, the archetypal feminine uh, sea of dark compassion and then further on to hokma which is archetypal masculinity and then kether which is you know the godhead and then further on into the real void the ein sof so basically we're in this abyss moment where it's all you know if you read crowley's writings if you read the tenth aether and all of this it's the, the the world of adjectives he calls it it's the breakdown of the it's basically when you've done so much spiritual, spiritual practice that it's the last little bit where the ego is hanging on and it's just going crazy and spinning every illusion it can and undermining every truth and it, you know, everything is being eaten as if by quicksand you know, the quicksand of, of discursive thought pu- a push to its utmost. And the lesson of Doth is there's no way, there's no intellectual way to transcend it. It's not possible. The only way it's transcended is through silence. And so I think if you look at our society right now, I mean, just look at, you know, basically the internet, Twitter, Facebook, the, you know, the state of the media, the state of politics, it's all doth. It's all, you know, that experience of the abyss of hallucinations and the maddening, like self, uh, self consuming, uh, endless chatter. Well, this is all, this is all in Kabbalah. It's all written up in the Enochian Aethers. So, um, in terms of where do we go from here? Well, We'll see. I mean, you know, you know, in terms of these things playing out on a cultural level, uh, interesting. You know, I think that you know that we're seeing a lot of manifestations of. Certainly, you can see in the the women's witchcraft movement a lot of manifestations of Vina, um, some healthy, some unhealthy. Uh, the male component is yet to show up. I would say, uh, which is probably frustrating for everyone. Uh, and um, but you know, these are th- these are cycles that play out over thousands of years or certainly hundreds of years. And so right now we're kind of having this culture, there's no clear sense forward and and people are trying to go backwards into reactionary thought, which is, um, you know, also a mistake. It's, Crowley would call that the black brotherhood, you know, refusing to give up the ego altogether and and fixating on on the past. so it's it's just a trip. It's a trip process we're going through, and and I, I think the only guidance I can give is it is a trip, and it'll you know most of us will be okay on the other end, and and I, I think that uh, you know silence, and that's the reverent silence uh, of, um, and not just silence, but the in, intuition because Bina represents the pure intuitive faculty that is post linguistic. So we're going to the post 
linguistic levels. And um, I mean, that's my Kabbalistic analysis of it. Is that absolutely true? I don't know. I mean, I think that in terms of what are the short-term effects going to be, I don't really, unfortunately, I don't think, I don't see any other future, at least for the U.S., than balkanization. Um, and if not in the physical, then certainly in intellectually, I mean, the U.S. is basically is, is fragmented into different tribes of political belief. Uh, we can thank the Facebook and Google algorithms for this. Um, and I think that people are just, you know, basically we live in a, a, a society of people that are all hallucinating in their own self-constructed corners of reality. Um, it's a very dangerous time. So I think it behooves uh, more, you know, or, or rather one of the tasks of initiation right now is to see beyond that and to try and understand, uh, I would certainly say at least to use the internet to understand reality from as many different angles of political and religious and, and group belief as humanly possible and to get out of the reality tunnels that uh, Facebook and, and Google and the news put us into and to try and see that the reality that people have bought now is a total lie. The reality, no matter what their beliefs are, the reality is that we live in the most peaceful time in history with the most powerful tools of human communication and of will working ever. I mean, you can read any occult book or theosophical book from the early 19th century, and they're all talking about telepathy and action at a distance and bringing things to yourself immediately and mind to mind action. It's like, well, guess what? Your phone does all of that. You don't even need magic anymore. It's like we live in a magical existence now. All of the cities you want are already created for you by technology. So how do you navigate that? How do you deal with that? And I, I submit that the magical tradition is actually, actually shows some pretty clear guideposts and, and maps for orienting yourself in a world that literally is nothing but will and imagination. We've lost the grand narrative. We've lost what people believe before, which is that there's one story about reality and we're in the abyss, we're in chaos. And most people can't handle that. They're drowning in it and they're projecting false narratives. And, you know, they're going back to these weird Cold War narratives and it, it, it's all madness. But if you understand that it doesn't have to mean anything, you know, well, then you're, you take the, the magical view. It's like, you know, it's, it's a sea of chaos there for you to, um, project your will into and we have infinite tools for doing so i mean anyone with a phone has more power than you know anyone living even a generation ago it's it's unfathomable you know and and anyone who has access to fossil fuel anyone who has can access gasoline has you know they they has more power than somebody with a hundred slaves working for them in the middle ages that, that's literally that's an actual figure gasoline um you know refined petroleum does more work for individuals than owning a hundred slaves did in the middle ages. So, um, you know, that, that's how far we've come on the power curve. You know, there's the classic Stuart Brand quote, we are, we are as gods, we might as well start acting like it. And I think that, that we need, an, people need an initiatory map and structure to do that. They can't just snap into it, but, um, but they're not, you know, unfortunately people are collapsing before the task of the 21st century, which is, I would put it very succinctly. It's like, yes, you know, like it is all chaos. There is no ultimate meaning. Therefore, therefore, it is our moral imperative not to collapse into, into nihilism. It is our moral imperative to project meaning that is um, nurturing and supportive of, of the world and of everyone around us. It's up to us to construct that positive meaning, even if we know ultimately it stands on nothing. It's just a projection. It's like a sand mandala, but it is our moral imperative to construct that reality around us. Cause otherwise, you know, what, what are we going to do? Just wallow in chaos and nihilism for the rest of our existences. Unfortunately, a lot of people are going to do that, but it's, uh, that's a failure to, to cope, I think. Yeah. That's, that's some dark stuff. How, <laughs> how well, can we well, it's positive too? I mean, you know, it's like, it's, it's it, how, I mean, you know, if you want to be a magician, there's your dragon to deal with, you know, it's an adventure. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And how can we in like a practical sense, as you mentioned, like silence is this antidote. How would that translate in someone's day-to-day -day life? If they want to check out of this kind of chaotic void of egotism, and move towards 
silence and discovering their own sense of meaning, how do they go about that in like a practical way? Because at one hand, we have all this technology and it's so useful and it's amazing. But on the other hand, it's like driving us insane as you were talking about, like what are some ways that we can at least individually, even if society's, you know, destined for some crazy times, how can we individually put that into practical use? Yeah, well, meditation, you know, is, is the glib, obvious answer. But yeah, I mean, society is headed for crazy times, but it, it always has been, you know, it's like there was the Black Death. <laughs> so, so um, you know, and, and the reality is that we live in a very nonviolent and, and we live in a time with refrigeration, for God's sake, where we can get food on demand. Most people can. So I think that the challenges of our time are spiritual and intellectual challenges, which is a nice upgrade from you know, dealing with starvation and gangrene, but they're, they're, they're serious challenges nonetheless that carry severe um, penalties if they're failed. So it's not like it's a, a not, not a important thing. It's very critical. So I think that, you know, number one is cultivating a meditation practice. And by that, I mean, cultivating no mind states, uh, meditating to bypass the conscious chatter of the mind. That is the, you know, whatever way you want to do that, the eight limbs of yoga, uh, Buddhist Vipassana, I teach both at magic.me, but cultivating that every day for a half hour a day, that's, that's it, right? Like that's the critical technique. And outside of that, I think it's understanding what, you know, the hermetic tradition would call your true will, which is what are you meant to do here? What, what is your, cause we only have limited time. So once you clear the decks, once you clear out the crap that is thrown at us every day, um, well, what are you actually here for? And so the initiatory practices of, of magic, of hermeticism, of, you know, even if one wants to do it in a more mundane way of, you know, psychotherapy can help with that. You know, even just journaling, things like this, or just, you know, spending a lot of time by yourself. Um, these are critical for understanding what is, is true, what do you truly want to do? I mean, what is your purpose? And you don't need to know it perfectly. Nobody ever does. But I mean, have a pretty good, clear idea of what that is and start going in that direction and and start working at that a little bit every day. And and after decades of that, I mean, you're going to be so far along. The reality is that most people are their energies are all dispersed by the onslaught of information coming at them. And so they're never able to formulate a positive will. So the whole goal of initiation is, is to be able to clear, clear out ritual. There's lots of great techniques for that. Meditation is great. Banishing rituals are great for that. Centering, you know, just all, all of magic is great for that. Putting yourself in the center of your universe. The, the other is formulating your positive will and then dedicating your energies to that. And if you don't know that, that is, I mean, most people are not born knowing that. So that's the first task. You know, that's, you know, discovery of one's will. That is the great work. And, uh, you know, certainly this is all the stuff that I teach at magic.me is all geared toward that discovering your, your purpose. And then basically it's, it's a question of, well, what do you, what do you say yes to in your life? And what do you say no to? And most people have a real hard problem saying no, but you got to say no to a lot of stuff, a lot of people, a lot of situations. Um, you have to remember that your mental diet, meaning what you look at, what you read, what information you intake is just as important as what you eat physically. I'm not saying to check out and be not aware, but you have to be very, very careful about what information you take intake every day. Cause we now all live in this weird existence where we're constantly absorbing all this junk information all day long. And, uh, you know, so that's, that's a really critical task for people now is being able to carve out the, the magician circle within that, you know, a circle that is like, you know, uh, where, where, the, where, only your, only the, your thoughts that you choose are allowed to exist, I would say. Yeah, I, I think that's really practical advice. And in the way that you've been describing, you know, where we're at right now as Doth and the world is so chaotic and how mindfulness and, you know, magical ritual and discovering your true will can be that antidote it just seems like i totally agree that we are in better times historically than ever um but 
it's almost like the entire world is either on some kind of like psychedelic trip, like being constantly bombarded with like negative fantasy. And I feel like just the way that social media and our smartphones and screens work, it's like to be mindful is a lot, lot harder today than it ever used to be. Like, I mean, living a rural existence, um, even if there were like diseases and famine and stuff, I mean, being close to nature was, would just be a more mindful existence than having like a slot machine in your pocket that's telling you 50 different like inflammatory and triggering things, constantly refreshing that and creating this like addictive like dopamine cycle of of craziness it 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 seems like yes mindfulness has always been really important but i think the times sort of demand for it now more than ever yeah i agree i mean we we really have not a whole lot of context for how much our brains have changed and you know particularly it's interesting speaking to some of my students who have spent a lot of time living rurally you know they've said you know look you know we get up um, kind of like do tractor stuff all day long, go to sleep, wake up a little bit at night, wake up a little bit, you know, go to sleep, you know, do tractor stuff. And when you're immersed in nature like that um, and you're not around technology, your brain is very different. And then you, you are in this kind of hallucinatory world where the gods are real and all this stuff. And, you know, if we, you read these texts of mythology and, you know, the ancient world and they're all talking about these experiences. Well, these are experiences that are, more attendant upon people who live closer to nature like that. And, and it's just totally cut off from us now. And we have very little understanding, although we now know for sure that smartphones and technology f- between the constant dopamine fixes and the blue light and all of this are deeply altering our brains. They're altering our sleep cycles. But I look at it like this, you know, again, if you go back to all these occult texts throughout the 20th century, they're all talking about you know, we're going to live in a new age where people are going to be telepathic, where they're going to be able to have action over matter. And they're also saying, you know, you know, this the great Buddhist ideal was that everyone will be interconnected and will realize that they're all one organism, right? And that seemed like such an occult idea even in the 90s, right? But here you go, right? This is what it looks like. And what we're realizing is, um, wow, now we have to deal with the worst uh, uh, filth of everyone's minds, you know, it's everyone and, and people are it's, it's interesting people are reacting to this experience by immediately wanting to censor everything, wanting to kick everyone off social media. It's like, well, if you know Freudian psych, uh, psychotherapy, it's like, that's not going to work. You know, it just it, the taboo will return even greater. And so everyone is basically lost in everyone else's thoughts. Now, for a magician, this is nothing new, but um, it's, you know, it's the hanged man in the tarot uh, represents the same experience. So, you know, here we are, it's like, okay, well now we have this mass interconnection, mass mind of 7 billion people, you know, or, or whoever, you know, will be 7 billion people very shortly as more and more people get on the internet. That's going to be really hilarious, by the way, when all the people in the developing world get online and observe the, the great privilege wars of the, of the first world from the lens of, you know, living off a dollar a week, uh, that will be quite interesting, I have to say. Um, but the, um, yeah, but people are freaking out, you know, they're having a bad trip. And so the challenge is, okay, well, how do we deal with understanding humanity as a mass mind? How do we deal with understanding that, you know, we're now confronted with all the greatest of humanity and, and all of the darkest and most despicable um, uh, contents of not just our own minds, but everyone else's and, and these archetypal experiences, much like they're, they're just like gods and demons and monsters and angels. It's, you know, they're, now they're mimetic complexes that exercise as much power over our lives as any medieval spirit ever did. You know, but what are those mimetic complexes built out of? They're built out of the, the collective minds of humanity, which was all these things were ever built out of. But now it's just on such a greater scale and made so much more visible. So we live in the sorcerer's kingdom. We live in the magical world. And so it's like... Um, you know, and so I, I see myself as all, like an anti-magician in a way because everyone is caught up in the sorcery. What you know, sorcery is illusion. It's plays of light. It's all everything is now is sorcery or viral marketing. You know, it's like it's all illusion. 
So the real path of initiation is not to make up a new illusion. It's to check out, you know, it's to be able to, um, Meant, you know, it's to be able to turn it off, to dwell in what is true, which is the voice of the silence, as Blavatsky put it. You know, the truth is always here. It's just, you can't, it is non-linguistic. Um, so hopefully I'm not spinning off too much into abstraction here. But um, yeah, I mean, this is, this is, seems to be our task at this time. And it's, it's an exciting period. It's an, ex, it's an exciting time to be alive, but it's a time that is destroying all of our presuppositions just by revealing it, you know, an apocalypse, apocalypse, the true meaning of apocalypse is, you know, revelation. It means un- drawing back the veil. And well, now we can see the veil is being drawn back on everything. And I, w- I would argue that the, the way to deal with that is not by shutting things off and censoring and all of this. It's just to learn how to swim, you know, cause it's not going to go away and we have to live with each other as a human you know, now we're living with each other as a one human race, but it's in high definition and in real time. And it's, you know, it's always now. So it's a fascinating period that allows for accelerated, I would say, spiritual development of humanity. Yeah, I mean, I really resonate with the concept that we need to be more conscious of the information we consume, just as I mean, nowadays, the obsession is all about like being super conscious about what food you eat. (laughs) And is it organic? Is it vegan? All that kind of stuff. And we need to be, in a way, very conscious about how much information, how much technology we are consuming in our daily life. And I think you're right that it's difficult to kind of check out of the system, you know, from time to time, but it's necessary. And once you check out, you're able to quiet your mind and recharge and seek out more meaningful sources of information. And I know one of the things that you recently launched is your magic school. So what was that journey like? Have you been like always teaching people about these topics or is that something you've recently Um, gotten into and and gotten fascinated by? Yeah, I've been teaching students since uh, probably, I mean, 2002 or 2003. So a long time. I mean, what year is it now? So over 15 years. Um, But uh, formally, I mean, I formally opened magic.me as a school, I think, uh, four years ago now, and four or five years ago. And I've taught you know, hundreds, I think probably thousands of people at this point, at least as full-time students, it's many, many, many more have consumed my, um, you know, podcasts and articles and things like that from the school. Um, And I've taught people from every possible walk of life you could imagine, you know, like from, you know, millennial Wiccans to, uh, you know, to um, hedge fund traders to, you know, and, and, you know, Asian executives, you know, in from, you know, Southeast Asia. Uh, and basically, from any walk of life, you can imagine, you know, celebrities, um, you know, privacy dictates, I don't, I don't mention their names, but you would immediately know who they are. Um, so one thing that I realized is that the, the need for this stuff is universal. And uh, so I've been very, um, I would say that I was dragged, dragged, <laughs> dragged into this position kicking and screaming it's the last thing that i wanted to do but uh we don't always have a choice about about our path sometimes Um, and i'm very grateful now that i am able to have this experience because i was very um i mean to be perfectly honest you know i was convinced if i started teaching it would be you know um uh i don't know it it it, it would be kind of cheesy and but what I've learned is that there's a, a real need for it. And um, I've been amazed by how sincere and open people have been to it. That I was also, because to be honest, I mean, like I was pretty scared that I was going to be judged doing it. And I, I certainly have in, in some cases, but for the most part, people have not been cynical. They've been totally like open to it and wanting to learn. And I think that's a really positive, um, that's something really positive that's come out of this. But I mean, yeah, basically I've been teaching everything, you know, from hermeticism, chaos magic, uh, astral techniques, but also, um, you know, real Hindu yoga, eight limbs of yoga, Buddhist meditation techniques. And I've just released the first mega training. So the school's been going for five years, four or five years. 
but I've just released the Adapt Initiative, which is the first in depth. It's a six week long mega training that really takes people from zero to 60 uh, in all of the core skills of magic um, and as well as meditation and also lots of information just on getting your life, just getting control of your life because people feel very much out of control. So the point of this course is to have people totally in control of their financial material destiny. It's to have their finances sorted out. It's to have uh, their, and, and to really build a solid base of their pyramid where the basics are taken care of and they have a little island of security so that they can do the spiritual practices to uncover what their true purpose in life is and then have the resources to fulfill that. That's the whole point of this. It's to free people spiritually and materially free them to fulfill, to determine and fulfill their true will, which is what we're all doing, you know, regardless of age, regardless of background, um, it's very hard to find those skills. Um, and I've got them for you all in one place. So, yeah, I really like the way you described it. And because me, I mean, I can relate to what you're talking about where you sort of discover your true will and then you drop everything and pursue it <laughs> without any f financial foundation to keep you covered. And that's been yeah. something that I've been s continue to struggle with because, you know, when you're, when you're on a spiritual path, every, things like finances and security seem really mundane and secondary sometimes. Yeah. So yeah. it's, it but they're not really right. I mean, and this is, this is not anyone's uh, shortcoming. It's like, this is like, and this is why I put this course together in a lot of ways. It's like, because that was me for so many long, for so long. And all of the, you know, like all of the spiritual people I know, like that's been them. And, and it's because of, there's like a, you know, there's like this dualist idea that's been set up in, and certainly in Western, uh, you know, Christian inspired thinking where it's like, oh, the material world is transitory. It's, it's, it's unimportant. It's like, well, okay. I mean, ultimately, yes, that's true. But if you can't, you know, how are you going to, you know, you know, to, to be blunt about it, you know, how are you going to achieve enlightenment if you can't keep the lights on? You know, it's like that you need to be able to, even if you go back to yoga, what are the first two rungs of yoga? Yama and Niyama, do's and don'ts. The whole point of that, which is the same as, you know, the the opening practices of Hermeticism and Malkuth and all of this, you know, it's like the whole point of that is you need to stabilize your life so that you have, so that there's no drama. You know, it's like the whole point of Yama and Niyama is to avoid actions that lead to drama and to have a quiet and stable existence so that you can meditate or pursue spiritual practice for long periods of time without being consumed with anxiety, which most of which results from financial instability or not having one's place in the world sorted out. I mean, a lot of young guys come to me, um, young women, I think, almost always have their stuff sorted out way better for whatever reason. Scarlett is grinning at me right now. <laughs> I'm the more organized podcast host of both of us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you know, it's like women have to mature sooner. You know, it's like it's a it's a well known thing, and um, but uh, a lot of young guys and and older guys um, often come to me and they're drifting and they're they um, haven't sorted the basics out and um, you know that's I think that's obviously true for both for for all genders right but um, that's somewhat been my experience and you know it's like you have to you have to be able to situate yourself in the world in such a way that you accept your social duties and and I'm always you know one of the most in you know one of the core things that has been inspirational for me in this is just studying classical the classical Vedic system classical Hinduism um, understanding, you know, in India, everyone is absorbed or classically in India and in classic India, pagan India, um, the golden age, India, everyone was absorbed in spiritual practice. However, there were levels in the sense that yes, there were people who were sadhus who were renunciates who dropped out to pursue spirituality full time. And everyone else was expected basically to clothe and feed those people. That doesn't happen now in India. And it doesn't really, and it certainly doesn't happen here. That's not a reasonable expectation to have. This is the mistake that people made in the 60s where, oh, if we, we just drop out and, you know, we're hippies, then, you know, we can just travel around in our VW bus and ask for, I don't know, free handouts for the rest of our life. Well, not so much. And 
you know, I think particularly millennials uh, um, who have lived through the economic crash have such a different attitude about, you know, have real anxieties about money. You know, it's like the, the you know, the need to be addressed. It's like critical. I mean, people forget about the baby boomers when the baby boomers did the whole like tune in, turn on, drop out thing. The baby boomers were because of World War II were the wealthiest generation in human history. And that was all because, you know, their parents, you know, to editorialize for a second, had waded across Europe, killing tens of millions of people. And we're now threatening the entire world at the point of the atomic bomb. That's why America was rich. It's really grim. And, and so that was why the baby boomers were able to drop out and not worry about it too much. The baby boomers in their, I believe in their 20s, owned something like 33, 35% of the wealth in the entire country. Millennials have 3%. So the, the idea of like millennials don't, millennials live in the real world. Okay. Like, and generation Z probably even more, I don't have as much of a context, but you know, th- this shit is real uh, for millennials. So the, I, so to get this, be told, oh, like, you know, money is beneath you. Just like throw it out, like just live like a free spirit. It's like, well, yeah, yeah, how, <laughs> right? You know, so, you know, I think that it's hilarious because um, I think that for most millennials, I can talk about magic. And like the idea of magic is like, okay, like they're totally on board with that. But like talk about buying a house and they'll be like, dude, wh- what are you talking about? like buying a house, like what, what are you talking about? (laughs) You know, it's like, it's like that is way more fanciful for them than the idea of that uh, magic might be real, which I think is quite telling. Right. So, so these are real, you know, shit is real, right. It's like, these are real issues that, that, that millennials, it's everyone faces. Right. And, and don't get me wrong, you know, baby boomers, all of that, you know, all the boomers are about to enter retirement. And if they think their social security is going to be there, good luck. Right. So, you know, we live in a different, we live in a, um, a much more insecure time. And so these things have to be handled and they must, it's like, and they, and there's, no, you know, it's part of the spiritual path. You know, you've got to situate yourself in the world and the way that you do that is by not being a sadhu, but by fulfilling your Dharma, you know, fulfilling your duties to the world first. And that means career, family, all of this stuff, you know, it's like, it means accepting, uh, the crucifixion of the world in a sense, you know, because those are duties that have to be um, discharged to society. Uh, and, and so, I don't know, I could go, I could go off on another big tangent about this, but. Um, well, that makes total sense. I mean, it's just like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Like you got to get situated a little bit first before you can expand your mind to the extent that yeah, you'd absolutely. like to. And yeah, absolutely. I mean, I wish there was like a pagan clergy out there. If I could just like become a priestess and like <laughs> check out of the world, but I can. And that's why, you know, like so many people in this world do offer courses and, and I'm a tarot instructor. So I do my own course because, you know, we have to figure out our own ways to make this our life. And this, as you said, it's our dharma. This is our meaning. This is why we're put on earth to to share this occult knowledge with others. So we we got to make it work. And um, for our listeners, definitely check out his uh, magic school. It sounds really fascinating and I'm going to check it out myself. Um, yeah. Well, there's a, I've seen magic.me and over the, I mean, you've had lots of different courses over the years. Like it sounds like this new one is sort of like sort of more everything wrapped in one, like sort of like getting it all together and the, the, because I've seen that you have individual courses on like tarot astral travel meditation chaos mad like so does this so would this be good for beginners and advanced people in the way that you have it set up yeah so i have a couple there's a couple different levels to magic.me now there's the, the what i'm calling the core curriculum which is about 15 different courses on every possible angle of 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 esoteric spirituality and you can get all those as a just on a subscription package which is really cheap and uh or or inexpensive i should say certainly not not uh not cheap in quality Uh, this is profoundly good stuff um and then what and there's this new tier or this new I'm calling it like the the edgy Christopher Nolan reboot of Magic Dot Me, uh, <laughs> which is like it's 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 not that it's all together in one place. It's a completely new level. I mean, it's a real it's an an initiatory experience in a in a true sense. And it there's material in there. It's a 
it's not just me talking about magic and sharing magical skills, which is what I've done before, but it's, it's a six week, you know, alchemical process. It's a, we're doing magic. It's a life transformative process in which people are going to get all the skills, but there's nonstop homework. There's, uh, of course, it's assembled in such a way that people can do it even on a very busy schedule, which we all have now. So if you can budget about half hour meditation a day, you know, and then, and then, you know, listening to very short 10, 15 minute updates on a regular basis. Um, but it's meant to be a process instead of just sharing information. And, and, and so it's a totally different, it's everything that I've done before has led up to this. And this is kind of the beginning of a new spiral level uh, to just taking this up to much more, it's much more practical, much more situated in the real world. Cause I just know a lot more now uh, and having done this nonstop is my full-time job for at least in this version for five years. I just, you know, nonstop working with students. I just have a much more context on what is actually needed. And um, so it's going to be a phenomenal experience. I've already got uh, close to 200 people signed up in it and it's going to sell out very shortly because I'm just going to run out of space to, to, to hold people. And um, so I recommend it if anyone's interested in it to jump on it right away. It's going to start in January, but yeah. Yeah. It seems like, well, it seems like it's important to add that structure as things get crazier and, you know, to charge a certain amount of money that reflects the value of it because everybody wants just free. I mean, this podcast is free. There's lots of free stuff out there that is not structured. And I think people that are, practicing these things could always use a little bit more actual structure as opposed to like, Oh, I'll, I'll get to it when I get to it. You know, you know, right. Absolutely. And in my, my life, it's like the, when it's a real structured experience like this, it's like, you know, it's like, yeah, it's a commitment. You know, I'm asking for a commitment from people. I want people in the class who are going to take it seriously. And so that's why it's structured like that at the same, you know, cause if it's just free, if it's just like free out there, it's like, you know, it's just another thing passing in the night. And then of course it's taken out of context, which is what has caused all the problems with magic in the first place. It has to be done in the correct order in the right context. So, um, but you know, but like I said, like most, a lot of this course is going to be dedicated towards improving the real world quality of your life. So, you know, what I'm telling people is if you take this, if you sign up for this course, you take three live units and you're not completely convinced that, you know, the value of the course is not going to be 10 times. You're not going to get back 10 times what the, what the fee is, then, you know, I'll give you your money back. And, and because I feel that strongly about it and the people that I've w- walked through this stuff had have had such a phenomenal experience with it that, you know, like just, you know, if the people who take this to even half as well as the people I've already taught it to, they're going to be very, very happy. You know, people have already been telling me this is the best investment they've ever made. Uh, And, uh, and these are people who are financial professionals, things like this. So. uh, Well, it's good too. Like if you put all this um, time and effort, like you were saying, traveling the world and exploring on your own path of initiation. I mean, like once anybody is initiated into anything, is there anything else to do, but teach it that it seems like the only sure. thing you can really even do with, with reaching that point. So, well, well, this is a really critical point actually. And I'm glad you bring this up. It's like, uh, no, uh, I, I think that teaching it, you know, not everyone is or should be called to teaching it. And I think it's kind of like, it's kind of like yoga where everyone who takes yoga ends up becoming a yoga instructor. I think that that's a failure of, um, now that de- we definitely, we need good teachers, but, uh, but it's, it's also similar t- to the U S educational system where everyone who goes through, for instance, a humanities uh, program on the other end of it can't really do anything except teach it, except propagate the memes. And so they just become an, an academic. That's a real failure of not the person I would say, but the edu- the, the educational track, because the whole point of particularly initiatory systems all the way back to the Eleusinian mysteries is self-revelation. It's to show people um, who they are and what they're, what, you know, what is the core thing that they're supposed to be doing in life and if it's just to propagate the system, that's a, that's a failure of the system, I would say. I think that, you know, we want, what we want is a society of people who are 
have a, an active spiritual level, who have active spiritual practices, but are in every single aspect of life. That, and that's, that's, that's what we have to some extent, but even more so, you know, so, so people who are in government, people who are in finance, people who are in media, people who are living, success, fulfilling successful careers in the world outside of just their own interests. And um, that's how we get a more enlightened society, for lack of a better way of putting it. You know, and I think that that's, that's real spiritual practice as well. And that needs to be emphasized where, you know, yes, you can drop out of society and be spiritual full time. Um, I certainly did not. I mean, I, I, I mean, I do this now, but I spent my entire twenties working in the real world in media and advertising, you know, on Madison Avenue and offices, you know, I worked with the U S space program, I, you know, so, so you have to have experience of the real world, even if you're a teacher and it's, preferable to just live a normal to fulfill a normal career it's a lot easier and um it is spiritual practice people have this idea they've inherited this idea again probably from the 60s that there's something bad or a day class a about the real world it's like no that's where it happens you like you know spiritual practice does not happen in the temple or in the meditation seat those are those are like training wheels those are like vrs to test it out. Real spiritual practice happens in one's career and in one's relationship, right? And in one's family, if one has a family, that's where spiritual practice happens. Uh, and, and in one's relationships with other people. So the temple stuff and the, um, you know, the, the Masonic style play acting or the, you know, the, the Wiccan style, um, uh, stuff, it's, it's very useful to get the point across to people but that has to be discarded at a point. And you have to understand that this is that all this stuff is, is systems and metaphors for living life. And then you have to, you have to live life full on with this stuff. If you stay in the temple for forever, you know, then um, it's, it's kind of wasted in a sense. I know that's kind of harsh, but um, this is a point that I would really like to get across to people is that the real work is in your life. And, and particularly, particularly relationship, I would say, I think if people, we're more clear about that it would it would help them quite a bit but so so yeah i don't want to you know teach more teachers i want people to bring this stuff into not just their chosen career but you know like their core path in life and and like i said i've taught you know people you wouldn't believe from walks of life that you know you would never think would be interested in this stuff yet they are so yeah it's it's so right when you're talking about the need to integrate spirituality and this knowledge into all areas of your life, not just things that are overtly spiritual in a sense. And it's also great to hear that you have worked with so many people from all these different walks of life. And as we are about to enter the 2020s and in this potentially darker age, I do think that the ray of light on the other side is that so many people are seeking out this knowledge and thanks to you and, and many others like you out there providing this wisdom, hopefully it'll help us get through some of those rougher patches coming up. So yeah, I mean, I know you have to head out. You're going to be on coast to coast soon, I think. So um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for this discussion and for coming on our show. I know Dan and I have learned a lot, and I'm definitely going to be looking into your course tonight. <laughs> um, might make a, a purchase. We'll see. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much. So, wow, guys, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Jason. Like, I feel like the more we talk to people about this upcoming decade, it's it's getting gnarly, as you would say, Dan. And we have a lot of crazy stuff coming up, but we have one very significant bright note because next week is the Cosmic Keys anniversary. I think I'm going to buy a bottle of champagne and we're going to drink it on the next recording. What do you think? Totally. Yeah. And if you guys want to give us a little birthday present for our podcast, do please consider becoming a Patreon. So for five bucks a month, you can get our full extended edition of our episodes. So yeah, that would help us out a lot. Or if you're not able to do that, you can also go ahead and give us a five-star review on iTunes. That helps out a lot too. Yes. Rate us on iTunes, join our Patreon to get the extended version of our episodes and... You know, I can't help but think that we made a sigil 
at the summer solstice and i think it's kind of working it's coming true we're getting big guys and we got big dreams bigger and better we got jupiterian dreams yeah totally wheel of fortune week too so as the wheel spins you know you can share some fortune with us too for the holidays so thanks so much guys and we'll see you next week see ya see ya